Germain. Let me introduce us to some more of the world's deadliest gangs. On the world's deadliest gangs, we take you on a tour of the world's most dangerous cities to see some of the world's most terrifying criminals. Tonight, we see one of the oldest and meanest street gangs of all time. But you won't find these in the downtown slums of LA. Tonight's gang are based in the land of tower blocks and bad attitude. Yes, it's grim up north. And if you're not dodging rain, you're dodging bullets. They're the street gangs of Salford. On tonight's show, drugs and guns and the downfall of dance culture. The gang member turned club owner who knows how to stay one step ahead. But first, the story of Gunchester. <laughs> Salford, Greater Manchester. Headquarters of one of the most notorious gangs in England. Murder and drugs, family ties and armed robberies. Carrier bags full of ease and a turf war that was to destroy one of the most vibrant club scenes in the world. Stick on your Joe blogs and come and meet the criminal pride of the north, the boys from Salford. Back in 1991, 1992, uh, a small time drug dealer was shot dead in his home in one part of Salford. The event was major news for several days. Last year, we had another person shot dead. This time, it was with a high-powered submachine gun in broad daylight on a Salford street where kids were playing. From that, you can gauge that the problem's not gone away. If anything, the criminals are better armed, more violent, and more prepared to push the limits to get what they want. Born out of urban deprivation, the lads from Salford are world famous. Not bad for a bunch of criminals that only number in the hundreds. By the time I was like 24, I'd already seen like four people shot dead in my life. And it, and it isn't funny. You know, when you stood next to somebody, the next minute you're wiping his brains off your face like that. If Big Brother gets hold of a Subaru and has got money and has got style, or so-called style, little brother wants it. These northern bad boys are organised into small firms with family allegiances. In Salford, historically, there's been a, a number of families who are rooted in crime. And even if one generation are caught and locked up, there's another generation waiting to take over. The Salford boys love quick and easy money almost as much as they love their shooters. No wonder that they have a long history in one particular crime. The city regularly produces extremely violent gangs who are prepared to push the limits to get cash. Robbery is the main pastime. A Salford-based gang hit the headlines in the late 90s for employing a novel way of raiding banks and security vans. They simply ripped a dirty great hole in them using battering rams attached to trucks. This secret police footage shows the gangs at work in a Salford lockup. The group were finally caught and sentenced. The Salford gang are not the only players in the city. Different parts of Manchester are run by different crews. People who drank in a pub all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they weren't just a group of friends who drank in a pub, they were now the Pepper Hill mob. People who stood on one road whereby they were selling drugs on it were now the Gooch Close crew. When they're not fighting each other, the Salford lads turn their attention to their main rivals for the city centre, the Cheatham Hill Gang. The 
the Cheetah Mill gang will be involved in various crimes uh, of the normal type that you would expect with drugs, uh, prostitution and what have you. They are close to the city centre and will vie with other gangs for ownership of various clubs in the city centre. Further south, two other gangs from Moss Side have had their own battles with Salford. You will find certain streets uh, which will carry the names that are well known to the media, such as Donington Close and Gooch Close. They compete with each other and they do compete with the other gang members um, in other areas of Manchester. And the newest villains on the block, the Long Sight Crew. The Long Sight Crew, as they are called, um, are pretty hardened and there are quite a lot of violence incidents, perhaps even on a daily basis, um, compared with, say, Moss Side or Cheatham Hill. Long Sight, Long Sight, Long Sight Gooch, Long Sight Dodditon, you got the Pitbull Crew, and there's just a new string of names which just come into me every other day with gangs sprouting up all over the place. These violent Mancunian gangs have had to get organised to get ahead. classic structure of the gang is that there's uh, one so-called Mr Big, who will probably have a lieutenant or maybe two, and then there's uh, an immediate uh, posse of foot soldiers who are there at his beck and call. That leadership has now crumbled. You're now getting fragments of people all over the place. There's loosely a little bit of Gooch left. There's loosely a little bit of Dorrington left. But these are just remnants. The same can be said of Salford, the same can be said of Cheetah Mill. You've always got some new young gun on the block who comes out of nowhere and starts shooting people again. Back in the day, you could speak to one person and he could say, right, you got to stop it. Now you can't. But what of a future for these Mancunian villains? Someone wants to go one better and you are then in a kind of tit-for-tat war of who is the most cold, who is the least feeling, who is the most psychopathic, and who can deal out the worst elements of violence, and will do it immediately, without question, without thinking. Uh, and you, you, you basically got a recipe there for a very trigger-happy um, gang culture. Still to come, Happy Mondays and the Salford Gang Connection. The gangster turned club owner. But first, gang warfare. After extorting all the businesses in their local area, the Salford boys moved into central Manchester. It was the beginning of a period of gang warfare that was to rip the heart out of Manchester's nightclub scene and earn the city the label Gunchester. These are guys who turn up to nightclubs, right, with, with, with waterproof clothing on, bulletproof clothes, right, but you, your balaclavas rolled up into a hat on the head, gloves on, a mat 10 down the front. You need all goes out to a nightclub like that. The carrying of weapons in clubs reached a point where, I mean, like, the, the ceiling of the PSV club was leaking every time it rained because of gunshots. What you've got to bear in mind, between 80, 88 and, and 91, you know, there are several gangs and several, several powerful gangs in Manchester. When this youth culture arose, it was the coolest culture in the world, and it was in the middle of the city, and it was their people. This is now a cool scene. We go here, we do it. It's us. I've seen innocent bystanders get shot dead, you know, when you're, you're for some cockeyed, pissed up idiot who can't shoot straight. Controlling the club doors was crucial if the Manchester gangs were going to survive. Controlling the doors meant controlling the dealers, if you control the dealers, the lucrative drug trade was yours. They control uh, the drug marketing that goes on within that club, and they tend to want to control it almost exclusively. What I have seen is a load of frightened um, club owners and club managers sat down there, defenseless, thinking, well, what the hell do I do? It was a trade that was worth fighting and dying for. And it was every club that was affected by either a Salford gang or one of their rivals. Even the Hacienda, the club that put Manchester on the map, was dragged into it. In running the Hacienda in the late 80s and the 90s, um, we came face to face with the first bit of gun culture. And the first bit of gun culture was the gang of its time, which was Cheatham Hill. 
having new guns and going around the whole of Manchester, not just our club, but one particular Saturday night and showing everyone their guns and saying, hi, we come in here now. In 1990, 21-year-old Cheatham Hill gunman Tony Johnson was spotted in a bulletproof jacket carrying semi-automatic firearms. It made the police significantly improve their own capabilities. Within a year, Johnson was dead, shot in the mouth by a rival. You get the rise of Salford and our problems then became Salford based. Now from down Regent Road here to take over and become the prime force in town. While the two black gangs from over there, the Gooch and the Pepper Tree on my side, uh, we had very little to do with except once every six months when we did a jungle night. We had a brilliant head doorman called Roger and Roger was kind of from north of the city center from Cheatham Hill, not part of Cheatham Hill, but respected and liked by all of them. No security staff is paid enough to put his life at risk, particularly during those days when um, gang culture in Manchester was becoming very, very serious. I would have to make it my business on behalf of the club to make sure things ran successfully, that I got to know these people. Work far better to show the main gang leaders X amount of respect and get the same respect back, in, whereby they would manage and keep control of their other gang members. If there was a night with 1,500 people and it was going crazy and there was like 100 gang members in, who gives a shit? If it's a bad fucking night and there's 350 people in and 100 gang members, God, the place feels shit. Hacienda, before he finally gave up the ghost, as it were, um, he actually had airport-style metal detectors on the doors, uh, but this did not stop a mass of um, of people going in with knives and, you know, hacking away at various people. It still ends up, regardless of what measures are taken, that if a gang really wants to actually wreak vengeance or enter a club, they will. We're the big guys, we come in free. We're the big guys, you give us a bottle of champagne free because, you know, we're heads. And then if any of your staff would refuse, then they would bash a bottle in their face. Shootouts in the city are still happening. The Salford boys are behind some of it, but what of the future? Drug and gang culture has spread quite prolifically throughout the UK, particularly in the inner city areas. It's not something that's going to disappear. And they're a fucking nightmare because they're just bullies. <laughs> More tales from the gangland after the break, including dress codes, branding, and gang warfare. Remember, dead men don't tell lies. Welcome back to the world's deadliest gangs. Tonight, we're in the land of beer, soccer, baggy jeans, and dance music. The street gangs of Salford have been running the club scene in the city centre on and off for well over a decade. Before rave culture hit the mainstream, most youths were into punk or goth. A new look was desperately needed, and who would have thought that new look would have come from the scruffy streets of Salford? In the late 1980s, youths across the world unwittingly copied the image of the Salford street gangs. Um, Manchester, it rains all the time. Everyone has Gore-Tex jackets. It wasn't about that part of the trousers. It was about that part. It was about the width. The Salford gang are the only gang that can truly be called British, inspired. From New York to Sydney, well-educated youngsters were roaming the streets, looking and acting like working-class northern dropouts. The image was transmitted around the world by Salford pop group Happy Mondays. They themselves had copied the image of their mentors, the street gangs of Salford. They were a gang, I think, very... Culturally, they felt like a gang with even the, the stresses and the fallouts 
that gangs have, and the fact that the gang had a boss, which was Sean. The Happy Mondays often boasted about being petty thieves before they were famous. But it was the combination of fame and the introduction of a new drug, ecstasy, that really brought out their gang behavior. It was a significant member of the Mondays team, naming no names, who made the first trip to Amsterdam in an old battered car and brought back a large bag and sold some very cheap and some very expensive. And that became the first importing of ecstasy in a large quantity. I mean, the Beatles never, never imported LSD. You know, the Beatles, you know, were fed it by someone at a dentist party in Harley Street, weren't they? But the, the Mondays were at the core of even the importation of this drug in its early days into this northern city. The success of the Happy Mondays went side by side with the rise of the Salford gangs. The gangs had free entry into the city's best nightclubs. The gangsters were rubbing shoulders with regular club goers. Because of the influence of the Happy Mondays, street fashion and gangster fashion were inseparable. At around this time, artist Chris Harrison had begun a project in Salford taking photographs of Salford youths. As is the way in Salford, many were members of street gangs. It was pure work and class. Shirts out, smart shirts, and clean, you know, really clean and a real pride in your appearance. Always smart, and it's a uniform. If you go back to that period and look at the way the gang members dressed, it was orange juice, Joe Bloggs, uh, Hacienda kind of wear. So you've got the baggy tracksuit bottoms and the baggy shirt, but they were not hip hop. You couldn't look at them and say they were, they, they were hip hop inspired in their shape maybe, but the patterns of them were unhip hop related. They've really taken on board the music that came from Manchester and, and that area. <laughs> When your club is under siege from the gangs outside, you have to take drastic measures. ex Pepper Hill gang member Tony Stevens has been subjected to gangland threats over the last three years. The club has taken a siege mentality and some awesome security measures just to survive the onslaught from the gangs that wage their war outside. Right, so as you can see here, this is the entrance to the club. Everything is completely bulletproof all around here, just in case if anyone does want to start taking pot shots from outside, which has never happened yet, and touch wood and metal, it won't ever happen. I'm walking from the premises of work, right, to my car, and this guy's saying, see, you could have smoked you while you're walking from there to there. That's what I have to live with every day. There are 17 uh, infrared cameras, which ISDN linked to a security control station. So everything that we're saying and everything that we're doing now is actually being recorded away from the premises. Everybody who comes through the door, a photograph is taken. So just in case if an incident was to happen inside the club and it did come to a court case and someone denied it, they were actually in the club at that uh, time, we can turn around and say, well, we can prove otherwise because here is a picture of you taken on that night and it's all date stamped and time stamped as well. My doorman, right, and myself have gone round there to people who were have a go on the door or whatever, right, and give it that the next morning on the perpetrator's door. And then when they see their dog get hoofed in, right, and then we're in there saying, all right, well, you wanted to call some grief last night, well, we're here to continue it or finish it. Which way do you want it? When they see that's how far you prepare to go, right, it's all of a sudden, well, kind of, hang on a minute, now the man's bringing his shit to my doorstep. There's a new breed of brainless moron out there who just believes that, you know, shooting somebody, right, is about as, you know, difficult as having a fight. So he's, you know, I'll have a fist fight. If I lose it, I'll pull out a gun and shoot him. Dad, it's, it's killed, it's nothing. Once we've searched them for drugs and weapons, and if they've got through that stage and they've got the right attitude, they then go through the first turnstile. Behind all the panels, everything down here is all bulletproof. There is a one-way mirror here 
whereby we can see the patrons but they can't see us. In the past what's happened is if someone has to be knocked back from a club, the first thing that they're going to start giving it is, well, you know, you're knocking us back, I know your face, I know where you live, I'm going to come and take it to you outside of here. Three members of the Gooch walked up to you, you're the bitch who's on the door of Club Havana, innit, right? And she just stood there like that and said, right, one of them grabbed hold of a baby and said, you know what? Right. I'm going to put the baby underneath the bus and I'm going to shoot you dead. One has gone like that one. This is on Oldham Street in Manchester City Centre, yo. She's like turned around and just said no, right? That, um, you know, yeah, she works at Club Havana, but you know, if this is what you are, you're supposed to be some big time gang. So if this is what you're going to do, throw my flipping defenseless six month old baby under the bus, right? And shoot me dead on the street because you can't get in a nightclub, right? Do it. And that was it. At least with this way, right, they can argue the toss all they want, but all they're going to be arguing with is their own reflection in there. There were people who wanted to be seen to be associated with gang members because it was kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah well, I know my man, and yeah, my boyfriend is such and such and, and whatever. Now, when the reality of it comes to it, you know, there were girls who were driving home with their boyfriend with the kids in the back, and someone's just seen him and sprayed the car with the whole family in it, right? The penny begins to drop. This is what you've got yourself into. There's a 99% certainty on our part that nobody can get through there with any kind of firearms or knives or any objects to try and hurt anybody inside the club. I think after the first three or four months, when every last gangster got knocked back in and whatever, it kind of put it through to everyone's minds that we were deadly serious about this and we weren't going to mess about. And I knew that this was Manchester's final chance. If this failed, this club that had a bulletproof entrance, the turnstiles, the cameras, the Robocop doormen, you know, whatever, if that failed, it was over. And basically what happened then was because it, it proved a success over the next 12 months or so, a lot of other clubs in Manchester then decided, well, hang on a minute, why have these Muppet doormen on who are affiliated with these gangs? Why don't I just go and ask my guy at Club of Anna exactly how he's done it? They wouldn't pay at the door, they'd bring in all kind of firearms, all kind of drugs, all kind of gang culture, attitudes. We've managed to arrest all of that situation literally because we can weed out all the potential idiots at the top of the door. Anybody who really wants to go and try it on inside here will be severely dealt with and put outside of the club forever. The street gangs of Manchester came to public prominence during the rise of club culture in the 1980s. The Salford gang became known for violent robberies, use of guns and control of the drug market. Even today, they're one of the world's deadliest gangs. Well, that's all we've got time for on the world's deadliest gangs. If you're worried about organised crime and gang warfare, remember, I can't help you, pal. I've got to get out of here. Later. Bank robbery, money, and the most feared of all. Or Gangchester. Well, you come on in, eh? Kidnapping. Power. Firm. The Yardies. If you have any trouble with organised crime, yeah? Call 1 800 Big Tony. Very naughty. The world's most dangerous cities. The Hell's Angels. The Drugs Cartel. The Bloods. The Crips. Hijacking and murder. The world's deadliest gangs.